Um, I guess I want to start with some statistics, really, because um, it's very clear that we live in a world that is still absolutely rotten, that is still absolutely riven with all kinds of inequalities um, and divisions. So, you know, you could speak for, for months, really, just giving statistics that show that oppression still exists, but here's just a handful of them. Um, in the US, black women are three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Um, here in Britain, 66% of government savings from the benefit cap come from women. Um, and the gender pay gap here is still 18%. So for every pound that, that a man earns, a woman earns 80p. Um, and on average, that is across, uh, across the workforce. Uh, in the US, black males born in 1991 are estimated to have a 29% chance of, um, of uh, imprisonment. That's seven times uh, that of white males born that year. Um, in Britain, on average, black people are six times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. That rises to 29 times more likely in the West Midlands, by the way. Um, Asian people are twice as likely, on average, to be stopped as white people. And people with white-sounding names are 74% more likely to get called for an interview um, after a job application than candidates with an ethnic minority uh, name, even if they've got the same qualifications. You know, this. These are just examples of, of the massive inequalities, injustices um, that still exist. For me, and for socialists, I think, this, you know, these are the kind of examples that we give to show that oppression exists and, and why we still have to fight it. Um, but also, they're exactly the same kind of statistics that people would give to show that actually for some, as I heard someone put it in a meeting recently, privilege isn't a theory, it's a fact. You know, so some people will look at those figures and, and, and see them actually in, in a slightly different way. But what I want to start from is the fact that everybody who is trying to fight oppression to end those, uh, the, those divisions um, and those injustices is starting from the same reality, the same world that we all live in and the same you know, disgusting kind of uh, um, um, inequalities that still exist. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's important to start out from saying that. But I also think that how we talk about oppression and how we you know, look at those kind of statistics and explain them is important as well because it informs the kind of strategies that we decide to use uh, to fight oppression. Um, so there's lots of new activism now around various aspects of oppression, particularly here we've seen a new feminism over, developing over the last few years, you know, but in, in North America, across lots of the world, but I'm going to mostly talk about the kinds of ideas that have come out of uh, North America and, and that we see here. You know, all the new kind of online activism around racism, around women's oppression, and so on. And lots of it uses the language of privilege. Um, for some, this is just a way of pointing out, you know, the injustice and the inequality um, that exists. For others, I think it's a much more developed theory, which is based on, you know, particular thinkers that I'll, I'll, I'll look at. And again, you know, there's all kinds of um, theories. Uh, there's not just one thing that you can call privilege theory, but I'm going to look at some of the most common or most influential ideas and, you know, where those theories come from and what the implications are um, for strategies to end oppression. There's one way to, to start in terms of understanding what people mean by privilege is to look back at those statistics and, and see them the other way around. So rather than seeing, you know, a woman earning 82p for every pound that a man earns, see it as men earning £1.22 for every pound that a woman earns. You know, this is literally, a first step is just to turn it around and say, rather than looking at the discrimination against the woman, let's look at why the man earns more just for being a man. Um, you know, it's like, and it's seen as an unearned benefit that, that men are, are getting just because they're men. You know, they're not doing anything extra to, to get that extra money, um, but, but they're getting paid more. There's also an, an element of, of privilege theory that I think is about um, saying, you know, why should we measure oppression by the oppressed? You know, why not look at the, the, the people who aren't oppressed? You know, why is it that um, a, a white male uh, is, is the standard, or is, you know, in, in, the, in their opinion, is, is considered to be the, the standard measure, and everything else varies around that? You know, so women earn 82% of what men earn, you know, and how about looking at it? The other way. So it's about making privilege, as they see it, visible. You know, looking at things um, that way around. So a white person enjoys the benefit. You know, if you look at those figures, of not having to worry very much about being stopped and searched randomly. I've never been stopped and searched um, by the police, so I'm sure that's partly because I'm a woman as well, and men are much more likely 
um, to be stopped and searched. You know, this is not because of anything I've done. It's not something that I would necessarily even think about. You know, if it doesn't happen to you, you don't need to think about it very often. Uh, straight couples don't have to worry about holding hands in public. It's not something that would occur to you to be a problem because no one's ever going to, you know, like to make a comment about it. You know, whereas gay couples, of course, you know, might, might face harassment. Um, so all kinds of little things like that, big things, I don't need to a bit of all those things, um, are, are what privilege theory is kind of taking its aim at, making those kind of things um, visible. You know, the, the things that, that people who are not oppressed in, in one way or another take for granted making it visible. You know, it shouldn't only be black people who have to think about race. White people should think about it as well. And there's not only one race black, by the way, there's the white race, and, and what does that mean? You know, and all of these things, I think there's lots of, uh, you know, there's some value in this. Uh, and I think in terms of on a personal level, there is a process that I think all of us go through and continue to go through all through our lives. Uh, when we become politically active, when we get involved in different campaigns and start to think about the world and try to challenge it, we go through a process of challenging our own kind of assumptions uh, and so on. You know, I grew up in a relatively small town in Essex that was very white. I was consciously an anti-racist, but that doesn't mean that I actually, you know, understood very much about the experience of racism uh, uh, for people until, you know, I moved to Manchester and met more people who were not white and who had different experiences and so on. You know, and these are things that go on all through our lives. I think, you know, that, that's a useful thing. But I think if you start calling, you know, not being harassed, for example, the, my ability to walk down the street and not be very likely to be stopped and searched, for example, um, a privilege, then I think, you know, you've got to ask uh, uh, where this is going. I think it starts to lower the sights of what we want to, to transform uh, in terms of ending um, oppression. Uh, one of the founding texts of, of the of current privilege theory is Peggy McIntosh's uh, White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Backpack, which uh, she first wrote in 1989 and then, and then developed after that. And so this was a list of 26 privileges that she identified. She's a white American academic. Um, and she identified 26 privileges that she enjoys as a white person. And she talked about it in terms of taking uh, the kind of ideas that she developed in a women's studies department, which is where she came from, and applying those you know, outside, of that, um, outside of that realm. Um, so she, here's, you know, I'll just give you some examples of the kind of things that she talks about as white privileges. Um, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. If I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I would want to live. I've questioned that one, by the way, in, in the US <laughs> since 2008. You know, I think many of us would have read about a kind of housing crisis. You read about people living in their cars in Walmart uh, car parks. I think. You know, the, the question of class, although of course this is something which I'll come on to and which, which is talked about in, in terms of privilege, you know, class privilege as well, that actually is not something that is really dealt with in any kind of satisfactory way in Peggy McIntosh's um, initial list. She's talking about the kind of privileges that she is a quite well off, you know, privileged in the old fashioned sense, if you like, a, a privileged academic with, you know, a decent wage and so on, the kind of privileges she can enjoy. Um, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured I'll not be fired or harassed. I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. You know, all of these things are, are obviously true for someone like Peggy McIntosh and are important um, in terms of, you know, seeing yourself represented in, in the public world, if you like, on, on TV and so on, etc. So, you know, these are important things. Um, but I think it's also instructive when you look at the introduction to uh, before that list, where you see that she actually sees it very much as a zero-sum game. So the idea of privilege is not just about um, saying, you know, everyone should have the right to walk down the street unharassed. It's also about saying, you know, that there's some kind of zero-sum, like, you know, the, the privileged have to give up something so that the, the oppressed can gain. Um, so she says, through the work to bring materials from women's studies into the rest of the curriculum, I've often noticed men's unwillingness to grant that they are overprivileged, even though they may grant that women are disadvantaged. They may say they will work to improve women's status in the society, the university, or the curriculum, but they can't or won't support the idea of lessening men's. 
Denials which amount to taboos surround the subject of advantages which men gain from women's disadvantages. These denials protect male privilege from being fully acknowledged, lessened or edited. So now we're moving beyond just kind of identifying uh, inequalities that exist or differences that exist between groups of people to actually saying that the problem is the privileged. And in, in her eyes that means all men who don't suffer from uh, discrimination because of their gender. And I think, you know, this is um, a, a problem at the heart of, um, of privileged theory in its, in its developed form. Because you start to making a very, uh, you know, clear claims about who the problem is uh, and, and how, you know, um, that, that somehow white people, men, um, you know, straight people, etc., people who are not oppressed for those particular aspects um, of, of their identity have to give something up um, if we're going to go forward. Um, and it also becomes very individualistic as well, because she's talking about the individual men that she knows who won't give up this or that, who, who like to keep their position and so on. She's not really talking um, about structures, about what causes um, oppression uh, in the first place. Um, there's a, again, at, at the end of, of the article, um, she says something kind of vague about wider um, systems. She says, disapproving of the systems won't be enough to change them. I was taught to think that racism could end if white individuals changed their attitudes. But a white skin in the United States opens many doors for whites, whether or not we approve of the way dominance has been conferred on us. Individual acts can palliate, but cannot end these problems. So, I mean, I agree that individual acts can't end these problems, but there's nothing in, in here, although she talks about, you know, the system, she doesn't identify what she thinks the system is, and, and doesn't really talk about um, how you can challenge that system. So even though she says, you know, that individual acts aren't enough, actually that seems to be all that, that her article there suggests you can do. Um, and I think that kind of vagueness about, um, you know, what the origins of, of, you know, what they would call privilege, um, and, and about the structures in society, if they are important, um, is quite common in uh, privileged theorists, if you read, you know, um, uh, uh, different ones. You know, because even those who talk about needing a wider fight to end oppression, which many do, almost seem to talk as if that's just something that will happen, there will be a historic fight against oppression, because there always has been, but that what we need to do within that is to be pointing out the privileges, um, uh, raising awareness, you know, among people inside the movement, um, and so on. And I think this is where you get to the kind of practices that people, I think, you know, we don't, haven't seen it so much here yet, you know, but I think it's starting, um, but seem to be quite prevalent in the US, you know, among radical movements and student movements and so on, is the, the whole kind of check your privilege calling out thing in, in campaign meetings, where, you know, in order to have input into a meeting, you have to get up and say, you know, a, a kind of declaim your own uh, privileges in order to level, you know, the field in the room before you're allowed to, to, to put your opinion in. Really. And, you know, obviously there's differences of opinion uh, in radical movements about how useful this is, but I certainly know socialists who I've talked to from the US who find it quite a destructive thing within the movement because you end up spending quite a lot of time actually attacking and focusing on each other rather than uh, uh, getting on with the project. Of, of the bigger enemy, you know, whoever that may, may be, and we'll come on to that again. You know, so I think the project seems to be quite limited to acknowledging privilege and, and not necessarily giving very much guidance about where you go next. Um, and Peggy McIntosh's uh, list was very influential and is a reference point for lots of people and was then kind of replicated um, for other fields. So uh, there was a list, uh, a male privilege checklist that came out of MIT in America, um, which is based on Peggy McIntosh's list, um, has similar kinds of uh, things, you know, so a male person, uh, my odds of being hired for a job when competing against female applicants are probably skewed in my favour. The more prestigious the job, the larger the odds are skewed. Uh, I'm far less likely to face sexual harassment at work than my female co-workers are, you know, and so on. You know, very similar things which are all uh, true. Um, but again, similarly, kind of you know, ignoring the class divisions inside of groups. So number eight on this list is when I ask to see the person in charge, odds are I will face a person of my own sex. The higher up the organisation the person is, the surer I can be. 
you know, that's definitely true. We know this from the figures, don't we, in terms of who's the boss um, in most companies and so on. I'm not sure how reassuring or affirming it is for a, a low-paid worker in an organisation, in, a, in a, you know, a hotel like this one, say, you know, if you're the cleaner, to go and ask the person in charge who's also a man. Does this really help you? You know, does this help you put you on a level with that, with that boss if you're confronting them over your wages or your conditions and so on? You know, so I think there's kind of a major thing missing. Also, I think it's worth noting, you know, because these, you know, these theories are coming out of academia here. So Peggy McIntosh came out of women's studies and tried to apply those theories elsewhere. And then other people have taken Maggie, Peggy McIntosh's you know, white privilege list and reapplied it to women's studies. And there is an element of academia kind of going around in circles and kind of, you know, um, um, you know to no, not necessarily, in this case, developing um, very much. I want to move on to some of the, uh, you know, a couple of the other thinkers because I think there are more sophisticated ideas and ideas that um, engage much more with, with Marxism and with historical um, change and so on. Um, but just before I move on to that, I do want to kind of focus for a minute on this point about identifying where the problem is because I think from the list, you know, from the, from the um, article of Peggy McIntosh, and also from, from others. You know, the, the worst problem really, really is the way that it suggests that it's all those who are privileged, you know, in, in their terms, um, that are the problem. Um, so there's a quote here from a, a, another academic woman called Laura Polido, and she says, white privilege is a form of racism that both underlies and is distinct from institutional and overt racism. It underlies them in that both are predicated on preserving the privileges of white people, regardless of whether agents recognise this or not, but it's also distinct in terms of intentionality. It refers to the hegemonic structures, practices and ideologies that reproduce white's privileged status. In this scenario, whites do not necessarily intend to hurt people of colour, but because they're unaware of their white skin privilege and because they accrue social and economic benefits by maintaining the status quo, they inevitably do. You know, so in this analysis, racism stops being um, an ideology, really, that materially benefits the ruling class, which I think is the way that Marxists have, have characterised uh, racism, and it becomes instead the inevitable outcome of, of having a privileged status, this quite static thing, I'm never going to stop being white, you know, and as long as we live in a racist society, this will put me in a position, you know, according to, to Polito, of, you know, unconsciously or otherwise, um, being part of the problem um, in the society. You know, so it becomes this quite unchanging and static thing that is related to individual identities, even as part of a structure, rather than something that, that you know, that a group of so in society that, that owns and controls and, and runs that society um, is actually benefiting from. And, and I think that leads as well to the idea that our identity determines our outlook. So men are blind to women's oppression because they don't face it. And therefore, you know, conversely, all women are highly conscious of women's oppression and, and understand it fully because they experience it. You know, and I think in both cases we, you know, we should know that that isn't the case. You know, just because someone faces oppression, that doesn't automatically make them, um, uh, you know, uh, conscious of it, um, politically active around it, part of a movement against it, or so on. And it also then you. Um, even if you thought people could, you know, if, if you're saying all women because they're oppressed as women can be, you know, are going to be conscious of that, um, what about the differences between women actually? There are some women who benefit a lot from the system as it currently is, despite the sexism uh, and the oppression that it, that it feeds out. Um, and, you know, coming back to, to racism again, I think, you know, because these kind of theories, it tends to end up with quite a bleak picture of our prospects for united struggle, really. If, I think it seems to be saying that we can, you know, we can become aware of our privileges, and that's what, you know, the intention of the theory is to do, to highlight and to make them visible. But it's unclear that that necessarily makes you part of the solution. It might, you know, make you less, less of a problem in a racist society, but, you know, it, it doesn't explain how uh, people can fight uh, in a united way against, against oppression. Um, and I think also it ignores the very real history 
of united struggles that we have seen you know particularly thinking of, of racism in the us you know there's all kinds of struggles of course there's many more examples of where racism has been allowed to divide people but actually there's many important examples of black and white unity and, and class unity against oppression and against racism um, and i'll come back to this as well um, so just looking at where privileged theories come from in terms of the, the kind of ideas and how they've developed, I think it's important to say that the theories are most influential and have, and have come mostly from, from the US, but they're increasingly influential elsewhere. <coughs> and I think one route is the, the kind of the fallout of the radical movements of the 68 generation. Um, and in the US, you know, there was a massive movement there. There was, of course, a coming together of the civil rights movement, turning to black power of um, the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement, which involved tens of thousands of students uh, uh, and others, you know, that, that you saw, you know, worker struggles, although they were less central to the struggles there than they were, I think, in Britain at the same time. But you saw a massive radicalisation in the 68 uh, uh, and onwards. Um, and after 69, really, the movement began to recede and fragment. And, you know, some of the key organisations that, that were at the centre of the radicalism um, fragmented. So, um, one of the key organisations in America was Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS. And this was an organisation that grew from a couple of thousand to 25,000 in the course of 1968. Um, but after the student movements and the, the anti-war movement started to uh, decline, there was a real fragmentation, and I think you started to see attempts to explain why it was the revolution hadn't happened in America, you know. Um, and, you know, one of the, there were all kinds of, you know, confused versions of some of Marxism, of Maoism, looking to China, of Stalinism, you know, looking to, to the Soviet Union and so on, and various other kinds of radicalism that attempted to separate themselves from, you know, any kind of connection to, um, to Russia and all of that. So one of the groups at the heart of the SDS was Progressive Labour, and they looked really to China and kind of distorted um, uh, Stalinized Marxism. And they were very dismissive of black nationalists and of third world national liberation movements. And this is at a time when, of course, you've got the national liberation movement in Vietnam, you know, be, really being the heroes for thousands of people um, in the US uh, challenging American imperialism. And I think their kind of politics you know, drove lots of people away. You, hot, you saw groups, um, uh, one group that was known at first as the Weathermen and later the Weather, um, uh, known as the Weather Underground and later the Weathermen, uh, they broke away and really looked to nationalist struggles as challenging imperialism and saw that it was a primary job of white radicals in America to break with their white skin privilege and really to, and eventually take up arms against um, the American state. Um, because anything less than that, really, would be an acceptance of privilege, um, which was just as bad as being a, a, being a racist as far as they were concerned. You know, now eventually that group, which is very small, became, you know, ended up kind of taking up arms in viewing the kind of bombings and stuff like the Bader Reinhardt in Germany, so you had the Weathermen um, in the US. You know, it really becomes a way of trying to shock middle America out of its complacency as they saw it. There were others who broke at the same time who believed that workers in the US and, and white workers in particular benefited from the privilege of being in an imperialist nation as opposed to you know, the nations that were being um, oppressed. And the conclusion I think they drew was that struggles by workers against layoffs or against um, um, speed ups at work or for better pay weren't actually struggles against exploitation. They were just going to increase the exploitation of workers in the third world. You know, it can confer even more privilege on, on the white workers in the US. So, you, as an activist, all you could do was fight in the interest of oppressed people in the third world. You couldn't fight on the behalf of American workers at all. Um, you know, all of these groups were small and fragmentary, and most of them disappeared within a few years. They weren't significant in lots of ways. But I mention this period because I think it lays the foundation for labour ideas. You know, it's not the direct route of the privilege theory that's currently um, uh, popular, but I think it is a set of politics that was rooted in a kind of pessimism coming from the, the decline of a passive movement and a disappointment in what, what the outcome had been, and it was generalising from that pessimism really, and I think it lays the groundwork for the kind of politics that later come out of the universities 
in the 80s and 90s. Because also, let's not forget, you know, lots of the 68 generation after they gave up on the streets and, and the big struggles went into academia and they founded women's studies departments and black studies departments and cultural studies and, and all of these things. And this is precisely where the kind of theorists that people are looking to now um, have come from, you know, who are focusing really on identity and cultural expressions of it. So some of the, the theorists that people look to now um, have come from, you know, from the early 90s, people like Macintosh, uh, Tim Wise. Um, another very influential area is the kind of whiteness theory. You know, I've come across this recently in the MA that I'm doing on, on literature. Um, very influential, you know, the notion of looking at race, as I mentioned earlier, not just in terms of how um, the black race was kind of created as a way to justify um, the treatment of African slaves, but how also simultaneously the notion of the white race was created as the kind of gold standard, you know, that, uh, that, that could be um, held up. Um, and so I think these are theories that have developed, you know, over a couple of decades and a couple of decades ago, and lots of things have changed since the early 90s in terms of the world that we live in. Uh, you know, we've had the whole era of anti-globalisation, anti-capitalist movements, the protests and so on, and, you know, people looking to try and explain things on a system-wide basis and understand how capitalism, you know, shapes all of those different oppressions um, that people face. But I do think that, you know, I think we'll be coming on to that more in, in the next session in this course in terms of um, intersectionality. Um, but I think it's, it's still the, the case that the theoretical framework that people are, are basing things on now hasn't shifted um, all that much. And I think that, um, you know, even though the economic crisis means that people are looking to Marx for explanations in lots of ways and looking to Marx for an understanding of, um, of crisis and capitalism, I don't think there's yet any sense of an understanding of the vital role of uh, the working class as an actual force for change in society. And I think this is understandable in lots of ways when you think, you know, we're commemorating the 30th anniversary of the miners' strike in Britain at Marxism this year. Um, there hasn't been a significant struggle on that scale since then, and, and that one lost, you know, so there's not, it's not like there's wonderful, you know, examples that I think can convince a new generation of people um, automatically and that it should become obvious that the working class is a key force for change um, in society. So I think none of this is surprising at all. And I think some of the ideas that are quite influential, you know, mixing in, so, you know, I've talked about the kind of fragmentation of the 68 movement that feeds into the kind of identity politics and, you know, looking at all these different aspects of identity in the 80s and 90s. But I think another thread that has been running through the last couple of decades is kind of post-structuralism, post-Marxism, these kind of theories. So thinkers like Michel Foucault, like Judith Butler, who is massively popular um, on all kinds of cultural studies courses um, at the moment. Um, these are, you know, when I say post-Marxist, I mean kind of engaging with and aware of the, the theories of the kind of new left of, of a radical um, Marxism that came out of the 60s and so on but also rejecting the ultimate conclusions of that about the need for revolution or the possibility of revolution, really, um, to, to transform um, the world. And I think what characterises some of these, these kind of ideas, the Foucault-type ideas, is looking at power as something that isn't concentrated in the hands of a ruling class or a group of people in society who have more power uh, uh, than the rest of us, but actually that power is something that is dispersed and multiple and existing in all kinds of relationships between individuals. You know, I think this idea is, is pervasive really in, in academia at the moment, but you look at absolutely everything as a power relationship, and so that, you know, you can see how this fits in really well with the kind of privilege idea, you know, that, that you know, uh, me talking to a, a black woman, you know, that, that, that that's a power relationship because, you know, we face different levels of oppression or different levels of privilege um, in this society. You know, so looking at everything as, as power relationships, I think, you know, becomes very diffuse. You're not looking to one place and saying there's a problem that we can confront, the state, the ruling class, etc. We're saying there are all these different, you know, unequal relationships and we have to take them all on so everybody just better get on with doing their own bit and challenging their own um, privilege and so on. Now, lots of privileged theories do actually see 
historical roots to oppression, and particularly racism. You know, I mentioned whiteness theory. This is very popular at the moment, and it's common sense in cultural studies now to talk about the historical roots of race and racism. So, you know, in, in very similar ways to the, to the Marxist analysis in terms of the development of uh, race, the concept of race and therefore racism uh, through, the, uh, through transatlantic slavery and, and the early days of capitalism. Um, and that's exactly how people explain it. But I think lots of those theorists um, reject Marxism, nonetheless, because they see Marxism as crude. I think they base, they have this kind of characterization of Marxism as something that's only interested um, in class, that privileges class over all other things, um, and isn't interested enough um, in oppression. So this is David Rodiger, and he is one of the key theorists of whiteness theory. He wrote a very influential book called The Wages of Whiteness, again, it's 20 years ago or whatever. Um, and he says, the main body of writing by white Marxists in the United States has both naturalised whiteness and oversimplified race. The point that race is created wholly ideologi ideologically and historically, while class is not wholly so created, has often been boiled down to the notion that class, or the economic, is more real, more fundamental, more basic or more important than race. You know, now I don't, I don't know what Marxists, you know, you may well be coming across Marxists, people who call themselves Marxists who, who do that. But I think it's based on a misunderstanding of what we're talking about when we talk about the primacy of class in our analysis um, of society. Um, I think that, you know, Rodiger argues that the creation of race was as much a product of the emerging white working class in America um, as it was the landowners, the slave traders, you know, the whole economic system of capitalism that was being built um, uh, around them in colonial America. You know, because white workers had the privilege of whiteness for him, and they wanted to hang on to that. Um, and he bases kind of the, the title of the book comes from W. B. Du Bois, who was a, a black American uh, a Marxist, who wrote about the psychological wage that white workers were afforded in that racist early days um, of America. Um, but he writes about Du Bois writes about it very much as a deliberate you know, strategy by the ruling class to make white people think they were part of a privileged group in society and that black people were somehow worse and therefore not unite with them. It was a deliberate strategy to pull people uh, apart. And that's quite different from saying that it was generated by the white um, workers themselves. So Du Bois says, uh, writes, the theory of race was supplemented by a carefully planned and slowly evolved method which drove such a wedge between the white and black workers that there probably are not today in the world two groups of workers with practically identical interests who hate and fear each other so deeply and persistently and who are kept so far apart that neither sees anything of common interest. You know, so for Du Bois, the material interests are very real and that is important. It's not about saying because race isn't real, it's not important. It's about saying there are actual material interests which should unite us and there is all this work being done by ideology coming from a ruling class which has an interest in keeping us separate. You know, so uh, that's quite a different thing. And I think Rodiger is really distorting um, what he's saying there. Um, there's a very good example from the early days of colonial America, which um, tells us something about that, I think, really, um, and which Rodiger, of course, doesn't really refer to um, in the book. And that's Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, it was in Virginia, which was obviously an early kind of um, uh, becoming a slave state at the time. Um, and I actually learned about this recently by reading a novel by Toni Morrison called A Mercy, which I really recommend. It's about the early days of colonial America. And she, you know, again, this is being taught to me as a postmodern novel because it has different narrative voices or whatever. It is not a postmodern novel. It is a novel which is saying there was a history of deliberate creation of race that pulled people apart. So she writes, uh, one of the characters writes uh, in, in the novel, uh, half a dozen years ago, it's a novel set in uh, 1788 or 1688 rather, uh, or whatever it is, anyway, half a dozen years ago, an army of blacks, natives, whites, mulattoes, freedmen, slaves, and indentured had waged war against the local gentry. You know, that's exactly what happened in Bacon's um, rebellion. Now, the, the mutiny lost uh, in, in the end. 
uh, or remain failed rather, and it was followed by a whole raft of laws which then entrenched divisions between black and white um, workers. Uh, so this is from Robin Blackburn, um, the making of New World Slavery. He says, by eliminating manumission, gatherings, travel, and bearing arms for black people only, by granting license to any white to kill any black for any reason, by compensating owners for a slave's maiming or death, they separated and protected all whites from all others forever in the interest of the gentry's profits. You know, this was a very deliberate policy of keeping people apart. Um, yeah. So uh, I think these kind of things are really important for us to remember in terms of history. You know, even if it's, you're talking about picking out small examples from a sea of, uh, of things that aren't as positive, you are talking about those high points that we can actually learn from and generalise from, rather than generalising from the low points and from the fragmentation and the breaking down. Um, and I think um, what's important about these moments where people have fought together is that um, they show that workers can fight against the kind of, you know, apparent interest of their privileges as, as white or whatever it is, you know, and incite, instead fight for a long-term unity um, of the class. And I think for privileged theorists, it's quite hard to explain why people would do this. Um, I don't think Marx had any trouble trying to explain why people would do this and why they should do it. You know, and here's some, uh, some quotes from Marx. In Capital Volume 1, he says, Whilst the cotton industry introduced child slavery in England, it gave in the US a stimulus to the transformation of the earlier, more or less patriarchal slavery into a system of commercial exploitation. In fact, the veiled slavery of the wage earners in Europe needed for its pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world. You know, later on, he writes, um, Labour cannot emancipate itself in the white skin, wherein the black it is branded. Um, he supported proletarian unity in an internationalist sense, and he supported the campaign of abolition. And this was taken up by lots of workers in Britain at the time, um, in the, the early um, working class movement in England. Um, so this is a resolution on behalf of abolition, which Marx defended at the time. Um, and it came from, yeah, uh, I can't remember, workers in England, anyway. Therefore, this meeting considers it the particular duty of the workers to denounce the base dishonesty and advocacy of slaveholding and to manifest the warmest sympathy with the endeavours of the abolitionists to bring about a final solution to the question of slavery. Um, there's another case where a, a trade union leader in uh, Sheffield called Roebuck, who was arguing that the trade union movement should recognise the South in the, in the Civil War, and the workers shouted back to this in Sheffield, the workers shouted back to him, never, we should have a civil war in England. You know, they recognise their common interests actually with workers, um, with, with slaves, you know, with black people in the South um, of America. You know, a real sense of our solidarity and of ourselves as part of an international working class is what we can learn from our history if we look for it, really. Um, and that means having to look through the eyes of the oppressed. You know, none of this is about saying it's not important for me to recognise, you know, someone else's experience, you know, that is different from mine. That's absolutely necessary. But the last thing I want to come to, sorry, just for, for a couple of minutes, is, is the, the accusation that Marxism is, is kind of economic determinism that is reducing everything to class. Because really I think this is a misunderstanding of what we mean by a class analysis and of what, what class is as well. Because, you know, this came up in, in the last session really, you know, in terms of intersectionality and the ways that, new, that people now are approaching oppression and absolutely making class a part of that. <coughs> which is a really positive thing. But I think all too often, current theorists talk about class as another element of identity. Um, you know, in one of the books I read, a, a kind of a, a reader on privilege, um, the editor says that class, you know, class is one of the, the kinds of privilege they will look at, but he says it's slippery because it's not instantly obvious. You know, we can dress up to look more posh than we are, or posh people can dress down to look more working class or whatever. Well, yeah, okay, but does this really have any effect on our relationship to the means of production in society and our ability to be part of a fight to transform it um, or not? No, it doesn't. Of course, it may have an effect on how individuals treat each other, and you know, that's something that you can look at, but I think that's very separate from understanding what the role of class is um, for Marxists. I think Alan Sugar's status as a member of the ruling class is not affected by his Cockney accent, you know, this is not how we measure um, what class is. 
I think looking at it as an identity makes it static and it doesn't allow for the political choices that people make either. Um, secondly, when socialists talk about the primacy of class, we are not excluding women or black people or, or, or any other oppressed group from that. Firstly, because the working class includes all of these people, you know, the working class, it's not Marxists who think that the working class is white men, you know, it's, it's a characterisation that comes, I think, from, from elsewhere and, and is quite lazy. But also, because we don't view class in terms of identity, it's not about prioritising one person, a worker here, over another person, you know, a black person or a, a gay person or, or a woman. Um, it's not about saying one person is more important than another person or one person's fight is more important than another person's fight. The primacy of class always has to mean building a multicultural, multiracial, multigendered international working class movement. That's what it means in order to succeed. Um, it's not about which struggle is more important than another, but it's about how can we win all of those struggles and bring them all together. Because I think, I guess, the final point I'm coming to is that, um, uh, yeah, that there are all kinds of different causes, historical causes, for, for different kinds of oppression, you know, and those oppressions change, you know, all the time through, you know, through the changes that come about um, in capitalism in the world that we live in and through the results of the political fights that people have over those oppressions as well. Um, you know, as one person put it, the oppression is multiple and intersecting, but its causes are not. You know, as Tony Cliff used to say, there are many roads lead to Rome, but there's only one Rome. You know, it's not about uh, dismissing the many things, it's about saying there's one way that we can change the world, and that is by the working class, you know, seizing the um, means of production where they are formed, you know, where the chains of production whatever it is, Rosa Luxemburg said something about chains. You know, um, that when, when the chains are forged, there they shall have broken. Um, so, you know, this, this is the importance of having a class analysis. It's not about privileging or prioritising one person over another. It's about understanding how we win all of these fights. Um, and that means that socialists have to listen to the voices of the oppressed. They have to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. You know, exactly as people have done. Uh, in Birmingham over the Trojan Horse stuff in the schools, as people have done over you know, the protests about cuts in ATOS, as people have done in terms of putting arguments in all of these fights that racism, that attacks on disabled people, that sexism can only benefit the ruling class who are really just you know, laughing all the way to the bank every time we're allowed um, to be divided. So I think there is, you know, it is really important, it's crucial that we take you know, arguments into the movement that we're part of the struggles that people are part of because we all want to fight oppression and put an end to it, but that we're absolutely clear there's only one way we can really put an end to oppression for good, and that is by fighting for, you know, that kind of multicultural, um, multi-gendered working class movement that we really need, um, and that is the only thing that can really transform things for good. One problem with Foucault's, and um, sort of how Foucault, Foucault the end, um, Sort of definition of power, sort of power networks, is that what it does in effect is because it says power is so dispersed and there isn't any sort of central idea of power, what you actually end up in fact is feeling that you're caught up in a net which leaves you feeling completely powerless, <laughs> as rather than locating power as part, as part of this um, economic and social system. And I think that's what, one of the sort of theoretical problems with it. But I think I just want to talk a bit about um, Thursday. I'm a teacher, so I was on strike on Thursday. And I, I think actually, if I think about my own workplace, I'm a teacher we're in Hackney, a very multicultural workplace. You know, actually, truthfully, there are also divisions in the sense that more of the teachers are white, fewer of the teachers are black, more of the support staff are black, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can actually look at the workforce like that. And it's absolutely true. You know, staff know that, I've talked about it, and there's tensions and this, that, and the other. But actually, I think what did happen on Thursday, because we were on strike, but our innocent colleagues were also on strike for the first time, you know, we had a joint union meeting. Um, we, we, you know, and we talked about that. We talked about actually, this isn't just about our pensions or your pensions. It's about the fact that actually everybody has been ground down by this government, um, ground down by this system. And actually, the way we're actually going to fight that is actually, is actually by going out together. You know, we had a fantastic strike. Our school was like shut down. It was sort of silent, closed. The few members of management crawling in. But basically, I think it was that kind of strength. But not when you kind of deny oppression, but when you actually talk about it and you work together to act against it. And I think that's a crucial lesson that comes out of actually leading that kind of fight. And I think that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing, very briefly, because I'll be told to shut up, is actually Tony Morrison. Because I think, um, I haven't read it immersive, but I think if you read something like Beloved, 
you know, absolutely fantastic novel. Because one of the things he does talk about, for example, is the underground cat railway, to, railway, railway in which slaves were sort of being rescued, which was, you know, run by blacks and whites. He also talks amazing sort of episodes that people know about the, the white girl who rescued Sethi on her way there. Um, another novel called Paradise, which works in a different way. But I think actually people always think quite rightly if Morrison was coming out of the, of the civil rights movement, which he absolutely did, along with that great generation of writers like Alice Walker and um, the great Mar Angelou and so on. But actually, I think crucially what she does in her writing is she just deals with oppression, absolutely, and she doesn't ever deny the difficulties, the problems, the sort of levels of hatred and division being created, but she does actually show a way forward that takes you much further than simply saying, say, you know, trying to set up a hierarchy of oppressions that you can't ever resolve through any kind of central way, what central um, fight back. Stop and search. I was thinking that a couple of German city of Hamburg, where for several weeks, a whole part of the city, everybody was stopped and searched by the police, so it can hit anybody. Uh, the whole theory seems to be extremely condescending. Uh, if I have a privilege and I can might be able to sort of give you a little bit of it, yeah. And uh, I think it seems typically of academia who want to have a bit, they've got a bad conscience and, and they just want to relieve it a little bit. And, but, keep their standards, yeah, not don't give anything away, really. And then, I think, on a, on a philosophical level, the question of humanness, I mean, for instance, if I'm not capable of really experiencing somebody else's oppression, that would, that would really mean I'm not capable of being a doctor, because I can't look after something unless I have the illness. But if I have all the illnesses of the world, I wouldn't be able to look at it after. I wouldn't be able to do any childcare, because I'm not a child, but it was a long time ago. So I can't, I can't even imagine what the child feels. I mean, that's terribly isolationist. I mean, it's a horrible uh, perspective on humanity. Uh, and I think that, uh, just to, to name another author, uh, Voloshinov, I mean, he talks about language a lot. I think it's a wonderful thing, because it's basically, he shows how language can be a revolutionary means of communicating to change the world. I thought that was a really interesting talk, and sorry I missed the beginning, so sorry if I mentioned it, Sally, I already said. Um, but yeah, I think that um, when we talk about women's movements, whether it's uh, the suffragettes or the women's liberation movement throughout the 1960s, it's important to include within that also actually the, um, the revolution in 1917, the Russian Revolution, and it's useful also when we're talking about, um, you know, privilege theory and who benefits and so on, because actually, what you saw in 1917 was not only the high point in class struggle as far as you know the first ever workers run um, state, but you also see it the high point for women's liberation, and it's something that's been buried in the textbooks. It's been buried um, by um, by historians and by the ruling class. And um, where actually what you see in 1917 is women's liberation and the women's question actually being absolutely central to uh, to the winning of of a worker state, the fight for socialism, and, you know, this came because of the reason that, you know, the work of the Mass Workers Party, the Bolsheviks, actually knew that um, the class society and the family were actually central to women's oppression, and that, you know, male workers didn't benefit when their wives didn't get paid as much, or when they couldn't have control of their bodies and have divorce rights and so on, and actually what happened was, there were systematic things that actually tried to lift the, the burden off of women's shoulders. So divorce was legalized. Um, you know, you see uh, the first ever uh, communal child centers set up and uh, laundries and so on. Uh, it was the first ever country to uh, legalize abortion in 1920. Um, in, in Britain, I think women gained the vote till 1928. There was universal suffrage in, in Russia. So I think, you know, whenever we talk about how do we actually fight, we always have to go back to the class, we have to go back to actually saying who does benefit, because at the end of the day, I know that you know, working, you know, my working class male friends, they don't benefit when I don't get paid as much as them. You know, the only person that benefits are, are the are the bosses and the exploiting class. Yeah, I think um, the starting point of this discussion is one of the reasons for discussing privilege theories because we've seen a very welcome resurgence of interest in the last few years in questions of women's oppression, questions of gay liberation, around all questions of oppression. And it's not a surprise that a growing movement grasps hold of all sorts of tools that are available to its disposal, available to hand, really. And one of the reasons that privilege theory can cut with some people, I think, not just in academia, but actually in movements, is because 
for a lot of people it makes sense of their own experience. If you are a woman, you're most likely to experience sexism, not at the hands of the capitalist system and the bourgeois family, but at the hands of a man. A man is the person who is likely to give you sexism on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're black, you're most likely to experience that from individual white people. Actually, if you're black, you're more likely to experience it actually from the hands of the state than necessarily if you're a woman. But again, you're still likely to experience racist violence from individual white people and not from the whole of the system. So this theory of privilege can seem to make sense to people of their experiences. But you see, I think it's a very, very problematic theory. All the ways that Sally has spelled out, because one of the elements of privilege theory is a great pessimism about people's ability to break with the ideas that are supposed to be emerge spontaneously from our identity. So a lot of the stress on privilege theory is actually about how it operates at a psychological level that people carry with them unconscious and therefore are really unreversible biases that come just from being a man or just from being white or just being, from being a straight person, something that you can't then break from. And if this is your starting point, we really are in a lot of trouble because you think about some of the big challenges that we face in Britain today, and actually we face all over the world. You think about, let's take one of them. Let's take the question of how do we stand up to the scapegoating that migrants face. Migrants who come to Britain are a small minority. And if you believe that all non-migrants have a psychological bias against outsiders, or against black people, or against Eastern Europeans, because they don't share their identity and their experience, then how will we ever win the numbers of people that we need to win to break from the ruling class scapegoating in order to stop that. And therefore we have to have a theory that starts with who is really to blame. Not the common sense explanation of its individuals and its, uh, its biased ideas, but that there is a system that is creating these systematic inequalities and that the expression of individual violence and prejudice is a symptom of a much bigger problem and therein lies a much bigger solution and that solution is the ability to break people from those ideas through the process of struggle. Yeah, you actually said what I wanted to say as well. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, what the last uh, speaker said. There's also, in general, just uh, uh, now and then a primary reaction of anger and it, it's to, uh, aimed towards individuals and, uh, and we should understand but we should go further than that and in that sense I think the perfect theory is really a product of the same division that it actually tries to well uh, resist against but not uh, so successful in a way because it's a very uh, study. One example um, and we, in the Netherlands, we also have debates about intersectionality, uh, black, uh, black activism, privilege theory, and uh, we spoke with one activist and asked her, well, are you going to the uh, anti-Putin protest in the Netherlands? And she said, no, I think it's actually a bit um, uh, uh, homo-nationalist. And we were like, yeah, okay, well, there's a, well, there's a stereo story to it. She was actually right because in the Netherlands, it's like, yeah, we're really tolerant here about uh, homosexuality, etc. When, uh, when there's a problem, well, you should really look outside, look at Russia, look at other countries, there's a problem. That's a problematic attitude. The point is, you're not going to change it when you like boycott every, uh, uh, every protest which isn't pure enough or which people are not aware enough or, uh, well, the thing is basically, the thing that's, um, that is going uh, the wrong way is the fact that yes, there are divisions and yes, it's good to address them sometimes be because when I'm very honest and I look at my own organization, yes, I see a lot of white male comrades and sometimes I think, yeah, uh, there could be more diversity in that too. But uh, when you think that it's unable for specific, specific groups to, to see alliances also, you should see not only divisions but also alliances and this is what the theory doesn't do and that's something that we as Marxists should do. So I'm very happy with this, um, this session. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, Sally's uh, talk because uh, uh, she, made, she helped me make a connection that I hadn't made. I uh, went through uh, the 60s in California and uh, was part of the, the one fight 
uh, civil rights, uh, grape strike, anti-Vietnam War, women's liberation, gay liberation was one point. And uh, uh, my uh, husband at the time and I uh, moved to, to Canada as part of the draft dodger, uh, the exodus, and uh, that was because he, right, he decided that because of his white privilege, he was um, uh, basically uh, not going to Vietnam, and there were black uh, soldiers going that kind of in his place. And so he went out, he didn't have to burn his draft card, but he went out and burned it, and then got arrested, and then so we uh, uh, moved to uh, Canada after that. Now, this may seem like a you know, roundabout thing, but what we realize is that there is a connection between that attitude and what you're describing in, especially you said, in the U.S. today. And when I got to Canada and started meeting revolutionary socialists, I puzzled over why all that huge uh, united effort seemed to be falling apart both in the U.S. and in Canada and around the world. And so I wondered, what, why didn't we win? Why didn't we win the revolution that seemed right there within our ground? Why was it so you know, disappearing in front of us? And at that point, I realized, because in the U.S. especially, we had been cut off from uh, the socialist history by McCarthyism. We had, we were ready to go, and we were revolutionaries, you know, and ready to do it, but we didn't have the theory. And I think uh, we cannot underestimate how important it is to, uh, to have those arguments with people, to hook their actual experience up with the theory that says it is only through recognizing the power of the working class that we can make those changes and actually engage in the one fight we all win. Yeah. I think a lot of what Sally said I absolutely agree with and I think there is, it's right that we are critical of privilege uh, theory but I think perhaps there's a bit of approaching it from the wrong perspective I and mean, it's that I think a lot of what Sally said and I think some of people said is quite academic and I think approaching it from the sort of academy was I think as revolutionaries who are active in campaigns against oppression against in other movements against austerity and trade unions that we do need to think about how people are using the concept of privilege in those that we might encounter in those movements. And I think um, it's important, therefore, to not to be critical but not hostile so that they don't ever talk to us again, because obviously we want to try and win people to revolutionary, to Marxist um, ideas. Um, so I think when, when we might be faced with people saying, like, check your privilege, I think we need to make sure that we understand what, what is being asked of us. I think that it, it can be like right to be just one thing, oh, I'm not going to check my privilege because of all the, the, the reasons that, that Sally said. And um, that's right. I think, but I think at the same time, it emerges from misunderstanding that often what's being asked is for, is being asked just to say things like, actually, women, black people, people from oppressed groups might not feel as confident to speak in meetings. I think we all are aware of this, and I think. There's lots of things that, for example, chairing meetings, you would try and prioritise women speakers over men to, to ensure that happens, or like in publications, trying to ensure you get women to write for them. Because I think we understand the structural nature, the, the nature of it means that oppressed groups don't feel as confident to, to speak. And, and often, I think, when people are saying check your privilege, it's not about saying you can't speak, no men can speak, or anything. It's about saying actually we have to understand the ways in which um, the the, the other people might not feel able to, to speak like them. This doesn't necessarily mean that we uh, have to capitulate to the privilege theory or talk, talk, talk about any notions of privilege in any sense, but I think we have to try and understand what people that we're working with in campaigns and in trade unions and in movements are actually asking of us so that we have the opportunity to try and win them to Marxist and revolutionary politics. Um, I, I thought it was a really important point when we talked about how um, discussions about privilege theory um, often rely on a very sort of crude idea of um, how Marxists interpret class. But I think we ourselves need to be careful that we don't fall into very crude interpretations of class too. 
And the reason I raise that is because um, this week in Socialist Worker, there was a, an article, a small article, joking about a 17-year-old public school boy who was mauled to death by a bear. And I was so shocked when I read it because I just felt, bloody hell, how, how callous can that be? And actually, I think most of the people I sell the paper to and talk to would think that was fairly shocking. And I just think it's quite kind of, really sort of um, careful not to fall into stereotypes because whilst I understand that when the establishment can use birth marriages, deaths as a weapon, then I'm quite prepared to as well. So I fully go along with Ding Dong the Witch's Dead and I personally organised the Franco's Dead disco back in the day. But I don't think that the death of a schoolboy, albeit a public schoolboy, and by the way, I've got you know, no time for private education is the point either. So I just think we need to be careful not to um, kind of conform to the stereotypes ourselves. And I think we let ourselves in a commit down to see. Bridget Parsons from Birmingham. I would just like to support what that speaker said, and I think we should actually just say we're sorry and that you know it was a bit of a mistake and forget about it. I just want to say I think when Gove attacked the schools in Birmingham, I think he thought he would divide the, the class in Birmingham. I think he thought that Muslim teachers and Muslim parents and Muslim governors were going to be on their own, uh, and he didn't expect, I don't think, the response that actually is happened, what's happened in Birmingham. Because we had a fantastic meeting a couple of weeks ago with, well, the evening last had a thousand people, but maybe 800 people. Um, it was you know, half, half Muslim, half not Muslim, non Muslim, I should say. Half the speakers on the platform were Muslim, half were non Muslim. It was a huge, huge show of, of you know, solidarity and strength. Had the Muslim population said, you know, this. We don't want you not Muslims involved in this because you're, you know, you also have privilege. Or had we said, you know, we have to sort of back off because at least this is the Muslims to fight, we would have been hugely weakened. In fact, you know, but we've had a couple of really big strong meetings, we've had protests, we've had petitioning, and it's been very much Muslim and non-Muslim together. And I think that has really actually surprised them and, and um, that, that strength is had we been divided and allowed ourselves to you know, sort of that we are somehow benefiting from this Islamophobia, that would have been disastrous. And actually, in attacking the Muslim schools, it's all of us that are under attack because now what they've tried to do is, is um, get rid of the NEA involvement totally in schools and turn them all over to academies. So actually, it's not just Muslims that are under attack and going now, but it's, it's all of our schools. Um, that was really fascinating and thanks for all the contributions there. I'll just say a couple of things, I guess. Um, I think the point about common sense and how that relates to theory is important because it's absolutely true that in lots of ways, privilege theory um, connects very easily with the kind of common sense um, that, that, that we grow up with in, in this society, which is that men are the cause of oppression against women, that white people, white races are the cause of, of racism, you know, that all of them are, and, and so on. Um, and I think it's very easy for the reasons that, that as we talked about, of our day-to-day -day experience to, to accept that. But I think, um, I think it is important to look at the actual, you know, the, the, the big theory, if you like, and how they develop and look at the kind of things that people are looking to, because you know, when movements uh, develop, as they have been doing in the last few years, you know, all these fantastic activism, uh, particularly over uh, women's oppression and, uh, and so on, um, people involved in those movements are looking for ideas, looking for explanations and looking for a lead about how do we actually go about changing these things. Um, and so, uh, you know, you may start with some kind of common sense ideas, but when you know when you start looking for theories, uh, you know these are the kind of thinkers um, that people are looking to, and I think it's important um, that, that we know who they are as well, you know, so that we can have those discussions with people um, about June Butler. Don't start there, by the way, but you know um, all, all these kind of uh, thinkers that, that people are looking to, and which filter down, I think, into um, uh, into the wider movements. Um, I think that um, the, the the point that the the, the last speaker made about the kind of, um, you know, the kind of individual rejections of, uh, of the idea of privilege, 
is, is really important as well because of course you know that's not why I reject privilege theory it's not because I feel defensive about being white or something like this you know um, I, I think it's really important for, for Marxists for socialists in the movement um, to engage in arguments you know quite you know like like today to have arguments that are um, you know that are on a, a, a friendly basis, but urgent as well. Because my problem with privilege theory is that it isn't good enough. It's not going to win. It's not going to allow us to beat oppression. And it's, it's directing people's anger and rage in the wrong direction. You know, and that's a tragedy for the movement. It's not a tragedy for me. It's, it's a tragedy for all of us who want to see um, a better world. And I think it can lead to a real frustration. Um, you know, I know uh, a, a woman who is a, a black feminist, you know, defines herself politically as a, as a black feminist. Um, and she, I think, you know, has kind of developed those politics partly because of, you know, a, a very valid criticism of mainstream feminism, which she sees as really being based on, you know, some notion that, that uh, of the kind of quite middle class white woman, really, and her interests. And that you know, as if every woman can be represented by you know this kind of idea of a, of a white middle class woman, you know, and she, you know, this really makes her um, angry and, and frustrated and feeling like she's not being represented um, by those movements. So I think her criticism is right in, in all kinds of ways, and I think you know when you look at the kind of debates that were had about the end of the second wave of feminism, this was precisely part of why it fell apart, wasn't it? it was because you know, the, the mainstream of the movement, the feminist movement, didn't, you know, uh, look to the, the interests and the needs of Latino women, of working class women, of black women, and, and so on. You know, and this is precisely um, the problem with these kinds of theories that end up trying to organize simply around the question um, of oppression. Because for me, as a, as a Marxist, it's about having an understanding of how all of these things are, are rooted in different ways, absolutely, and at different times, and you have to look at the history and understand why, but all of them are rooted in a class society which needs to exploit people in order to make profits, in order to keep producing, um, and so on, and needs to divide us in all kinds of ways um, uh, to continue um, to do that. And all those kinds of ideologies grow up through that and, and continue to have an effect. I think what the beauty of Marxism for me is that it is about having the patience to explain those things and to, you know, to, to keep fighting to bring people with you, you know, to not endlessly go around in circles about, you know, this or that attitude that someone has, to challenge racism, to challenge sexism, but to also, you know, link arms with people and pull them along in a fight that can unite us, you know, and that that is why we put class at the centre because that's the thing that pulls, you know people, whether they like it or not, they have to link arms with their, you know, Asian co-worker or, or, or whatever it is, you know, whatever those issues are. And I think people have given stories in this section and the last one um, that leads to that. I just finally, just on the, you know, if you just think about the opening rally of Marxism on, on Thursday evening, the people who were there, there was a platform of, I think, 11 or 12 people. And what was it? You know, I think nine of them were women, three of them were black, eight of them were strikers. Two of them were from elsewhere in the world. You know, there was there was a real sense on that platform of what what it means to build a multicultural, international working class movement. It doesn't mean that every single one of those people was there as a worker. Most of them were actually, but you know, some of them were there because of, of racist murders. You know, some of them were there because of um, cuts to disability. You know, I can't remember now. There's so many people. You know, hundreds of people, many of whom have been on strike. But that was the whole. That was what that platform looked like. You know. There is not a working class that is white and male. There never has been uh, and there never will be. There is a working class movement which can also actually be a pole that pulls together all those other issues that, that divide us and, and can push you know, uh, a, a rising tide for, for everybody and lift us all up. And I think you know, that's what socialist politics and, and keeping that red thread. You know, someone talks about the red thread being broken in, in the US really by McCarthyism. Events like this are so important because they're about remembering our history, learning our history, and, and transmitting it really, so that we don't keep making the same mistakes and we can keep um, building uh, and learning from the lessons of history. Thank you.